Language, of course, is, a, is an ideal vehicle to understand um, a people's people's culture, the way people behave, interact, um, interact with others, um, and of course also the history. So the the history of a people, and cultural history, is very tightly connected to to linguistic history. Um, and the case of Swahili is, is certainly a case in point. So um, it is both instructive and interesting and fascinating in a way. Um, to look at the history of the language uh, a little bit more detail. The history of Swahili is a fascinating story, um, spanning some 1200 years from the East African coast um, to its present use as the language of wider communication in East Africa. Um, and it's a global language. Um, in the next couple of slides, we're going to trace that history um, through more than 1000 years. The 1200 years of the history of Swahili um, can be divided into four different parts. From 800 common era to today, Swahili served as a coastal language at the beginning, then was used along the trade routes to the interior of the East African continent, um, then expanded also under the colonial administration, and finally is the language of wider communication of East Africa. Before looking at the history of Swahili proper, it's worthwhile going back a bit further and look at the prehistory of Swahili, if you like, the ancient history. Um, it was said some time ago in the 19th and early 20th century that Africa didn't have history, but that's of course as long as you can get. There's plenty of history in Africa and plenty of histories in Africa. Um, and one of these histories is the history of the Bantu languages. Um, Swahili is a Bantu language belonging to a large family of some 450 languages. And the origins of this family lie in West Africa in today's Cameroon and can be traced back to about 5,000 years ago. From the original location of the Bantu languages, slowly, slowly, the Bantu language has expanded through a process of movement of speakers, through um, social innovation, economic innovation, patterns of language shift and multilingualism. Um, slowly expanding southwards and eastwards, reaching East African coast some 2,000 years ago. We can talk about the history of Swahili proper uh, from about 800 AD. Um, at that stage, an early, early form of Swahili was established on the coast and then became the language of the entire coast um, as the language of a mercantile, seafaring, urban Muslim society. Um, there was a link with Islam. It was a city-based language. There were um, trading port cities along the coast, Lamu, Mombasa, Kilwa, um, and trading on Daos. Swahili traders used the monsoon winds to trade um, southwards for about half a year and then northwards again for about half a year. Um, and by 1100 AD, Swahili was used from southern Somalia down to northern Mozambique and the Comoro Islands. Um, it was also a time from then and onwards where Swahili culture and literature blossomed. So here is a famous example of 19th century um, Swahili poetry um, and a, an, an outstanding example of Swahili and African literature. And that is the, um, the Al Inkishafi, the soul's awakening, as it has been translated by Said Abdallah bin Al Nasir. Um, like all early Swahili literature, the poem is written in Arabic script, sometimes called Ajami. Um, and reading this poetry, like the Kishafi, is an art form. Um, Soas Archive holds rare recordings of the performance of this poem and other classical Swahili poems by the famous Swahili scholar, Shaykh Yahya Ali Omar. So here is uh, the first few stanzas of the Alen Kishafi. Um, on the top, we see the original classical Swahili, uh, which is quite different from modern standard Swahili. So the middle part is the standard Swahili version of it uh, provided by Poetry Kenya. Um, and then there's an English um, translation at the bottom. And I'm going to play Shaykh Yahya performing um, this, this beginning. Bismillah. 
hali ya kutunga hino nudhumu na rahmani kirasimu na basi arrahimi yumaika we have a lot of scholarship on these old strategic poems and there's still a lot of work being done it's a very active and fascinating and research area the next stage in the history of Swahili is the inland trade routes um, and the colonial administration and, and as Shota said also, um, resistance to colonial administration. Um, in the 19th century, Swahili traders and Arab traders established trade routes from the coast into the interior, trading um, ivory spices and also um, being involved in the slave trade. Um, these trade routes ran from coastal towns like Mombasa, Bagamoyo, and Kilwa um, westwards into, um, into the interior, reaching Uganda, um, western Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, um, as well as the eastern, in today's eastern GRC. Um, along these trade routes, Swahili was used and then became established in towns and cities like Tabora, Ujiti, or Lubumbashi. Um, around the same time, we also see the appearance of Christian missionaries from Europe um, and in their way, colonial administration, um, but also then resistance to that administration. And all these three dynamics are related in, in many ways to Swahili language. So from the late 19th to the mid 20th century, East Africa was governed by different colonial powers, English, German, Belgian, Portuguese. Um, Swahili was increasingly used as a language of education and administration. And we also see the development of Swahili writing and Roman scripts by Christian missionaries who would use Swahili for Bible translations. Um, however, Swahili was also used um, in resistance to colonial power, uh, most notably in the Maji Maji, or Maji, the Swahili word for water, um, of 1905 to 1907, where in particular southern Tanzania, a number of ethnic groups united to resist German colonial administration. And in that movement, Swahili was used for cross-ethnic communication, um, which was later used in independent language policy um, to show the pedigree of Swahili um, as an anti-colonial and cross-community language. A good attestation for the spread of Swahili, even in the 19th century, comes from um, a contemporary witness um, Johanna Barnabas Abdallah, who was the author of one of the earliest, if not the earliest, um, histories of the Yao, a ethnic group in southern Tanzania, Malawi, and Mozambique. And um, Abdallah was trained by the university's um, mission to Central University's mission to Central Africa, and he writes in 1894 when he was in Zanzibar at the um, Kiungani School, the university, uh, university uh, mission, mission society had set up there. Um, um, he says that we are so many boys in this house of different tribes, Yaos, Makuas, Bondes and Nyasas, but we all speak Swahili language. So that already showed that Swahili here was used as a language of wider communication across different ethnic groups and linguistics groups <clears throat> in Tanzania and indeed in Eastern Africa. Today, Swahili is the language of East Africa, used for wider communication in all public domains um, and widely spoken throughout um, the region. Um, after independence, Swahili became the national and official language in several East African countries, in Tanzania, Kenya, later on in Uganda. It is widespread in education, media, and public discourse, and there's a rich tradition of literature, music, and popular culture. Um, and then in the 21st century, we see Swahili becoming a pan-African um, and it is a global language reaching beyond uh, both the coastal, uh, coastal areas and indeed the East African mainland to wider audiences. Um, here are some um, visual impressions of the appeal and use in Swahili. On the top, we have an advertisement from Tanzania for a mobile phone company. And it says, Lurayetu Fahariyetu, our language, our pride. And it plays both with the Tanzanian national flag and national colors and the use of Swahili as a symbol of national identity. At the bottom, we see 
the use of Sheng, um, an urban youth language starting to be used in Kenya um, some decades ago and that's currently very, very popular. And here we see the Sheng Wa Cha Pa in an advertisement for a cash machine ATM. So it says Pata Cha Pa around the corner. We have standards really Pata to get then the Sheng word for money and then English showing how Sheng has been integrated into mainstream language use in Kenya. Um, and that's an example of the versatility of Swahili in adopting different forms and lexes. Um, the top image shows bilingual signage at Yuma Kenyatta Airport in Kenya. Um, and the uh, bottom picture shows the renowned Swahili scholar, Professor Clara Mumanji, who is delivering a keynote address at the International Conference of Chakita, uh, the Chama Chaki Swahili Chataifa, the National Ki Swahili Association of Kenya, showing um, the white academic interest and active research that being conducted on, on Swahili. Um, uh, this now takes us beyond East Africa and showing the global spread of Swahili. These are some um, countries where Swahili is taught at university level. Um, so it shows that um, we have Swahili teaching in North America, in many places in Europe, in China and Japan and Asia, in East Africa, of course, but also in Africa, beyond East Africa, for example, in Ghana and South Africa. And of course, we teach Swahili at SOAS as well. Here's a snapshot of our Swahili 1A module. Um, it remains our most popular African language and one of our most popular languages across the school. Um, and we have um, several um, teaching modules and also uh, lively research environments and, and seminars. I'm stepping back from the details a little bit and looking at the history of the Swahili language, um, it is indeed a remarkable story. Um, starting from a language spoken along the coast uh, to becoming uh, certainly the most important language in East Africa, an official national language in several countries, and indeed uh, a global language. Um, Swahili is taught at universities in North America, in Europe, Asia, and, and several African countries. Um, it's it's an astounding development over the last 1,200 years. Now, we can ask ourselves what's behind that, what are the factors um, accounting for this development, and there's a number of features maybe uh, which come to mind. Um, the first one is um, that Swahili for a very long time has been associated with trade. Um, so it was trade, um, Indian Ocean trade along the monsoon winds um, when Swahili spread across uh, the East African coast along the city-states. Um, and it was trade which then led to the um, use in the, on the continent uh, through trade routes up to Uganda, um, Western Tanzania, um, the, the present day DRC. Um, so trade always has been historically a, a driver of, of uh, language spread. Uh, languages associated with trade and business are good languages to speak. Um, and the other element maybe is the absence of of strong political power. Um, now, now, the Swahili always have been very important uh, traders, um, very important to commercial people, there was important cities, um, but there never was a big Swahili empire which was in competition with other people. So adopting Swahili as a language of wider communication didn't mean supporting a big political superstructure which you know, in many cases, people might have been reluctant to, been afraid of, apprehensive of. Um, you know, there's many cases in, in certain African contexts uh, where that happened, where a, a national language is eyed and suspiciously by minority languages because of the associated political power. But that for Swahili, that wasn't really the case. Um, so the the positive influence of trade, if you like, and then. Uh, the, the absence of political threat, on the other hand, were both very, um, very positive factors for the spread of Swahili um, over the last hundred years. Um, and the third element, which is important, I think, um, is the, um, the ability of, of Swahili to adapt to different cultures, and religions, and political ideas. It's, it's in, if you like, it's an ideological versatility uh, which has served the language very, very well over the last hundred years. 
so historically associated very much with Islam. Uh, the, the coast is very Islamic, a lot of uh, Swahili literature is influenced by Islam and there's an interesting blend of African and, and um, Islamic elements. Um, but then Swahili was used for Christian, uh, Christian missionaries, by Christian missionaries um, to, to spread uh, Christianity and has been adopted by many Christian congregations. There's lots of Bibles, Bible translations into Swahili. Um, and more recently, it's been strongly associated with, uh, with uh, in Tanzania at least, with Ujamaa, um, the uh, political ideology of, of after independence associated with President Nyerere, um, you know, sometimes translated as African socialism. Um, so that's a very different, uh, different set of ideas and different set of proponents of these ideas. But in any case, in all these cases, um, Swahili was, was very useful and was uncritically, if you like, adopted as a vehicle to, to uh, promote these ideas. Um, and the, the final element might be associated with this ideological versatility is the, is the ability of the language and the willingness of the language to um, adopt loan words like English, um, which, which has thrived really on, on you know, including and appropriating and using lots of lexical resources beyond the, the own narrow confines. Uh, Swahili has loan words and lexical material from Arabic, from Hindi, from Gujarati, lots of South Asian languages, of course, from English, but also from German, from Portuguese. And, and through that end, indeed, from many African languages, and through that has managed to enrich its vocabulary and, and the lexical structure and the expressiveness um, to, to an astounding effect. And I think all these um, different elements have contributed to the um, continuous popularity of Swahili and the, the result at the end of the day, uh, which we see today as a, as a global language. Um, with this, we have uh, concluded our short survey of Swahili history. I hope it was enjoyable and I hope we can continue talking about different aspects of Swahili at some future occasion. Shukrani and thank you.